disability uh, teams were under enormous pressure to uh, identify where expats, expats were, uh, to make sure that they were safe. Uh, people were trying to leave locations to come home, borders were being closed. It was a very, very difficult time of, uh, of crisis management. Um, once we've gone through that process and people had actually got their arms around where everyone was, made sure that they were safe or in secure uh, locations, that identified where they were uh, working from, um, then there was a period uh, in the late spring of more stabilization. So there was less of a need to be reactive. Companies were coming out of that, uh, that reactive mode um, and re-establishing a control, starting to think, okay, right, now we've got control again. Um, we understand where everyone is, everyone's secure and safe. What, what do we do now? How do we start to, uh, to, 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 to make sure that we've got control of our program once more? And that led during the summer of um, a period where everyone was trying to understand okay, what are the implications of, of this? We've seen this huge change in uh, the way people work, uh, in mobility across borders, um, and uh, this is having big implications on uh, us as an organization now and is likely to have an ongoing um, implication as well. So organizations spent a lot of the summer um, trying to just get their arms around understanding the implications and how that might be um, it, and sort of affected for, uh, for them. Um, and then in the last couple of months, we've seen again a little bit of a, of a shift where people have now started to think, we understand now that, for example, um, virtual assignments, people working remotely, um, the, 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 the shift um, or organizations having a focus on cost, we're starting to get an understanding for these, um, these issues and the new normal. And we now need to start preparation to get ourselves back into shape to be able to, uh, to, to address mobility in 2021 and the future, because it will look slightly different, um, we, uh, we, we suspect. Um, what's quite interesting as companies have gone through that process is that uh, there have been some unanticipated con consequences of the, uh, of, of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I had a great conversation with, uh, with the leader of a, a global mobility program in, in Switzerland, who um, said, uh, you should never waste a good crisis. Um, and actually using global, um, the, the global crisis and COVID-19 to, uh, to look at things that you've wanted to do for a long time within your global mobility function and using this as an opportunity to drive through some, some change or to, to do something differently, make a mark. And um, one of the things we did a survey with the Magellan network of uh, over 50 French companies and one of the things that very clearly came back was in that survey was that the, um, the internal profile of the global mobility function has been raised in many organizations by the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, so global mobility has had an opportunity to have a much more strategic impact and to be involved in discussions that um, in the past may have been difficult to, uh, to, to, to actually get to those, those tables and, and have a strategic impact on, uh, on, on business decisions. So um, yeah, that, that was an un unanticipated consequence of COVID-19, but um, is certainly um, very much welcomed. Another area is a re-evaluation of global mobility's role in the talent agenda. Uh, so um, the talent priorities have uh, understandably been shifted, um, but global mobility is, um, has through its uh, interactions with the business through the crisis period in particular, been able to, to establish relationships that mean that global mobility can now be more involved in discussions about what the future looks like. Um, and it's been a chance to do things uh, differently. And that may be from a number of different uh, perspectives, from policy to operational um, uh, organization, uh, governance structures, a whole range of different areas where organizations have had the opportunity through this to, to look at how they might do things differently. Um, 
Moving on then just to, to what the future of global mobility may look like. Again, this is uh, from uh, a survey that was conducted over the summer to understand how organizations are uh, reacting to, uh, to, to uh, the changing in environment. And you can see here the top three areas that companies are really focusing on and see as a long-term uh, issue for them to, to manage are reducing cost, um, aligning with the talent strategy, and then enhancing the employee experience. Um, interestingly, uh, in the financial crisis of 2008 and the period after that, reducing costs was also very important for organizations there. And it took a long time for that to come down the, the list of uh, priorities for organizations. And in 2019, it finally dropped out of the top five, um, but in the space of just three or four months once, uh, once the crisis uh, started, uh, that's come right back up again to the top of the uh, of the list of issues. Um, aligning with the talent strategy again is something that many organisations are, are considering COVID nineteen as uh, a very serious issue, obviously, and something that um, is uh, really important to manage through. But many of the underlying talent um, challenges that organizations have, growing the right talent, getting the right skill set, giving people the right opportunity to develop within the organization, to be international leaders of, of the businesses, those still remain. So actually the talent strategy and the talent agenda has continued to be a priority. It was before and it continues to be uh, now. And the assignee experience or the employee experience is also very, has become very important because um, there's been a realization that expats, when they are in uh, a different location uh, and borders start to close, there's uh, a lot of uncertainty. They need uh, good support, good infrastructure in the organization to help them. Um, so making sure that assignees feel uh, that they're well looked after and um, that, that the business is concerned about them and giving them the best experience possible uh, has also been a, a key priority. So there are some of the um, initiatives, some of the key uh, things that, uh, that we're seeing companies are expecting to have to continue to focus on through uh, 2021. The next area I was uh, just going to touch on was some of the priorities and challenges that uh, are being faced um, by the mobility teams. And um, this sort of aligns a little bit to, to some of the points that I mentioned before, but specifically some of the things that we're seeing um, globe mobility teams having to, to be much more aware of and, and focus on uh, are these, these three areas around compliance, complexity, um, addressing new and different ways of international working and the cost management, which I, which I mentioned before. From a compliance perspective, uh, quite interestingly, there are a lot of revenue authorities, so tax, uh, social security, immigration, uh, they relax some of their rules when people were trapped in different countries around the world uh, during the, the initial lockdown period. But um, increasingly, there's a, uh, a, a a realization now that organize companies countries sorry countries are, are looking to get their uh, their revenue um, streams back uh, in uh, intact to pay for some of uh, some of this and expats are a good area to focus on for uh, for um, the opportunity to uh, to be able to get um, revenue so this is a real focus area and the complexity of dealing with the past and then working out how to deal with the future is, is something that uh, is a is a is a increasing priority. It's always been a priority, but it's, the complexity is is growing daily. The new and different types of international working really comes down from things like we're doing this evening, uh, remote conferencing, teleworking, uh, being able to to work uh, in teams uh, across border um, remotely and, um, and, and having virtual assignments, virtual uh, work uh, projects um, has been demonstrated to work very well in a lot of organizations. So there's a real um, momentum and emphasis on uh, being able to to look at how companies can uh, take advantage of that and uh, that's um, a 
certainly a, a priority for uh, for global mobility functions to to look at those different types of cross border working and virtual working um, to make sure that uh, the organisation can stays compliant um, and that uh, also to the third point, if you're not sending somebody physically to a location, uh, that you can better manage your, um, your cost. So from a global mobility function perspective, some of the ways that they can look on that is to look at the policy, the governance and the operations, which I, I mentioned before. Um, so making sure that your different types of policies, the suite that you have, um, that they continue to meet the, um, the changing goals of, of the business making sure that you have the right governance structure in place so that you're choosing the right people, you're sending them on the right assignment at the right time for the right period of time so that you deliver the best return on investment. Um, and you operate, uh, oper your operations are optimized to, uh, to make sure that you get that compliance and also get that great assignment um, experience. Um, just as a little case study, very briefly, um, that second point, the new and international ways of working, I mentioned there, the, um, the idea of these virtual assignments. And what we've seen um, is, is really three different ways of, of working um, remotely. One is working from home. Um, so in an example, I work for Air Inc in Paris, but I do my uh, job from, uh, from home in Provence. Uh, so that's within the same tax jurisdiction, you're working from home. Um, so uh, sort of relatively straightforward, but I think useful just to clarify the definition and what the difference is between working from home and working from anywhere. That's sometimes called a distributed workforce. And in an example with working from anywhere, that's where you're crossing international borders. Uh, so for example, Air Inc again in Paris, they hire me to do a job um, in Paris, but I want to stay in Belgium, which I know many French people will uh, struggle to understand, um, but they'll want me to stay in, uh, I want to stay in, in Belgium, so then I'm working across a border, so I'm working from anywhere um, to fulfil a role that's in Paris. Or another example, um, I already work in Paris, but I have a holiday home in Tuscany, that would be nice, um, and uh, I'd like to work from there for three months during the summer. Um, and then the final example is this virtual assignment. Uh, so I work for Paris, but there's a, a role in Hong Kong that needs to be filled for a year. So I actually do that from my Paris office and I just travel to Hong Kong three or four times during the year, uh, but fulfill the role um, virtually as an assignment uh, in that location. Uh, so that sort of differentiates between the three different types of, uh, of, of virtual working or remote working that, that we're seeing. And as you can see at the bottom there, there's a whole load of issues that you need to be um, considering. Most companies have not done this before. They've been thrown in very quickly uh, to having to deal with uh, this type of working. Um, so there's a range of issues, which I won't go into in detail here, but uh, you can see them at the bottom there that, that need to be considered uh, when you're working um, remotely. Finally then, just very quickly to, to wrap up, global mobility and young talent. Um, in terms of looking into 2021, the expectation um, to start off with is that um, new assignments are really going to focus on business critical roles and there's likely to be less young talent mobility in the uh, immediate future in 2021. Um, many companies are saying there's a backlog of important roles that they need to have filled. Uh, they need to get people into new, new locations. So um, as the borders open up, there's going to be I think, an initial rush um, as expats are sent out because they are critical to the organization. Um, but then there's likely to be a, a period of uh, a relatively less activity uh, while organizations really focus on cost, on uh, being able to make sure uh, that uh, they're, they're managing their cash flow as, as effectively as possible. However, um, the need to develop new talent um, is still uh, considered critical uh, in most of the organizations I'm talking with. So there is the requirement to develop um, the uh, new talent, uh, young talent in organizations. Um, so there's likely to be a bounce back, uh, say unlikely in 2021, but further down the line, 
uh, global mobility for, for young, um, young talent is likely to be um, required. In, in particular, giving that opportunity for international experience is recognised men, in many organisations is really important for attracting and retaining young talent in, in the organisations. Um, and some companies are exploring the way that they can give people um, within the organization, young talent, the opportunity to have international experience in, in different ways from a traditional assignment. Um, so there are developmental assignments where um, you are able to go on a, a, an assignment for a longer period of time, perhaps two uh, years where you are able to develop yourself personally, but also have a, a, a role that you're developing in the organization, perhaps. Um, there are graduate rotation programs in some organizations. Um, and as, again, what we're hearing is mixed messages among organizations. Some companies are maintaining those. Some of them are pairing them back a little bit for 2021. Um, but looking to the future, they're, they're likely to bounce back. Um, short term assignments as well, giving people the opportunity to spend just three months or six months in an international location to gain international experience. And again, this final point that I, I, I mentioned before, using virtual assignments and international projects, teaming through, um, through remote working to build networks internationally to, with, with your colleagues, to be able to, to build the, uh, the international experience while maybe not um, having the opportunity to actually travel to the location, um, certainly on a, for, for a longer period of time. So there are some of the things we're seeing from a young talent perspective. I think I've probably gone over slightly on my time. So um, that was uh, what I wanted to, to cover for, for now. Towards the end, if there are any questions, of course, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thanks a lot, Mike. Yes, yeah, there are some questions, but I think uh, we could answer it at the end of the of, um of the session. Uh, so now, uh, thanks a lot for your uh, general uh, general presentation. Um, let's jump uh, in the in the company's uh, testimonies. So what I would like to to know is uh, how COVID nineteen impacted your global mobility strategy, and uh, what kind of changes have you implemented and planned for the future. So this is the question everybody wants to have an answer. So I don't know who wants to. To begin, uh, let's jump uh, with the, uh, let's go with uh, Agnes, for instance. <laughs> yes, so thank you, Celia. <laughs> so yes, so how are we impacted? I would say maybe first just to, to, to set the scene, why do we do expatriation um, in general uh, at Saint-Gobain? So why do we do it? I would say that it's for four main reasons, um, knowing that we have roughly 400 uh, expatriates. And just to give you an idea also of the, of the volume that we are talking about here, uh, from uh, roughly 50 countries to roughly 50 countries uh, as host. So it's really uh, uh, all over the world. Um, usually we do it uh, first and foremost, I would say for traditional reason of transferring uh, some critical uh, skills um, and really uh, uh, international deployment of some uh, some critical and, uh, and technical expertise. This is uh, maybe the first reason I would say uh, most the most natural and historical and then we do it for international growth when we open new countries or when we open new business in a country where we are already present but we don't have the, uh, the management in place. Uh, this is also very traditional I would say and uh, could be shared by all the groups here I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, and then uh, we, we want to build global teams uh, so in some of our regional headquarters, for example, it would be very typical that we, also, we want to have diverse teams. We want to have people coming from different countries. So this is also one of the reasons. And the last reason is, of course, to grow some talents and to develop uh, and, and retain uh, some talents inside the organization, knowing that, logically speaking, uh, in terms of career perspectives and career paths, um, you, having an international assignment as part of the career is really one of the key milestones of the development we want, we want to have uh, for our senior management uh, community, I would say. So we, we need to prepare this. And usually we try to combine uh, several of these reasons, I would say, when we, when we decide for an international assignment. So based on this, uh, what was the COVID impact? I would say that I recognized quite a lot uh, in what uh, uh, was just shared by, by Mike. Uh, I mean, it, it was crisis management mode. 
uh, for sure. Uh, and then uh, we, we matured a little bit on this. But uh, in a nutshell, I would say that it's back to fundamental and back to the core, uh, meaning it, it's, it's very much um, making us think about the why. Why do we do expatriation? Uh, what's, uh, why do we invest in global mobility? Uh, so this is really for me uh, one of the, of the key takeaway from this crisis. Uh, of course, uh, if I go back to basics, I would say that uh, yes, we it it, it puts uh, a kind of stop <laughs> to some of the assignments that we were preparing just for practical reasons because borders were closed, etc. So this this is part of the crisis management. So mechanically speaking. Uh, we have less assignees now than before the crisis. Uh, also, for because just it was not uh, meaningful to send people right now, where some of the plants were just closed. So if the plant is closed, you don't send the assignee right now. Uh, you could not do the induction. So just very, very practical aspects. But really, back to the fundamentals, I would say you, 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 you need. Uh, what I mean by this is that the first thing is that we said, okay, we need to take care of the people. Okay, so it's ab about the caring, uh, the uh, and the empathy that we that we owe to our people that we send abroad. So really, this is the first thing that I I, I call the core, uh, back to fundamental, caring about people. Uh, second thing is business continuity. You need to make sure that your business is going to continue uh, in times of crisis, and this is also uh, one of the uh, one of the fundamentals. Uh, and then the third point, maybe more minor uh, to me at least, is really, okay, what is the right governance uh, for such an international group? And I think that we all had this kind of uh, questioning uh, going through this crisis. Do we need to go more local because uh, confinement, uh, lockdown, etc., is local, is taken by countries? Uh, so do we need to be more local or what do we need to take care of very globally as a group uh, and uh, to, 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 to have a, a really a centralized governance? Uh, so this, this was also this kind of questioning. So volume effect, as I say, this is the first impact of, uh, of the crisis, uh, some delay in some of the assignments, uh, but also back to, back to the fundamentals and back to the core and to the why question, I would say. Okay. In do you see for 2021, uh, we, uh, Mike talked about virtual assignments. Uh, do you think at Saint-Gobain, uh, main of uh, that main of the expatriation will be virtual? Or if the business goes on, the, the frontiers are open, how do you see that? Yeah, I see that in 2021, uh, as Mike said, uh, we are going to have uh, uh, an increase in assignment because we just delayed uh, some assignments that are anyway critical. So, and this one will happen in 2021 as soon as we can. Uh, the second point is that, yes, we are considering future assignment, but more as an addition to our uh, existing policy. I mean, we acknowledged with this crisis that really there is something going on that was already in the under underlying trends. I mean, uh, working from anywhere was already there. It's just the momentum for it right now. So we need to have something, we need to develop a framework, and we need to take this also as an opportunity to be more flexible and to see global mobility in a more flexible way. But as I said, to me, it was already there. It's an underlying train that we had before, but just now it's you cannot just avoid it. Uh, and we really need to, to be serious about this. And it's really an opportunity to have also a more diverse pool of talents uh, working globally and internationally, I think. So it's really an opportunity that we see moving forward, but more as an addition to what already exists. Okay. And um, you talked uh, earlier about uh, getting more local. Uh, at Renault, I think uh, it's maybe the strategy you are heading to. Am I wrong? <laughs> to, to, more, to have more local? Yes, more virtual, more local. What, what ah, okay, uh, okay. Like? No, but I think it depends what we could do. Uh, you know, in Renault, today we have 1,200 expats. If you add uh, Nissan, it will be 2,500. So definitely when you compare this number with uh, what you could find in the other big company, if you take the ratio uh, total headcount versus expat headcount, so we are too, too big, too big. So one of the objectives definitely, because it's very costly, is to uh, decrease, first of all, the number of, uh, of expat uh, according to the economical situation. So we have a plan to reduce and to 
reach the target of the other group, it could be maybe 0.5% of total headcount as expat. First of all, this, this was the previous uh, policy before the COVID, I would say. And then, uh, so we have three main uh, reasons for expatriate, as everybody, business needs, uh, project, when you launch a new, for example, a new plant, you need some people for two, three years with high level of expertise, but in short term. And we still have some talent development for young people. So the cost of these three uh, policies is not the same, of course, the package is not the same. But then the COVID arrived suddenly and people were blocked in their host or own country. And even for the local, as you say, the local should uh, work uh, on remote mode. Um, by experience, everybody says that, oh, it works very good. So you can be based in one country and work for another country. And basically, when you think about that, you call it virtual assignment. It's not really virtual because we have still some people behind the virtual. But it means that you don't need to be 100% probably in the future in the host country. So you can work from, as Mike say, UK, Portugal. And on top of that, it could be really a competitive advantage to attract the best talent because today, when you want to attract people, you should be based in Paris to work in the headquarter. But if you have the opportunity uh, to attract people and they can stay where they are and work for the group, so with a kind of multi-pole, multi-headquarter pole for the future, it could be very interesting to have more diversity in terms of competency. And on top of that, uh, a lot of attractiveness. So basically now uh, the strategy is uh, as you say, Celia, on top of that, the cost, you can imagine the cost for a remote mode because you stay three weeks in home country and you can travel one week. It's totally different than you have to pay the housing, the schooling, the home law, blah, blah, blah. So the cost is very uh, low, so you can have more. So basically, yes, we are thinking uh, to develop uh, what you call virtual assignment for the future. Now we have to work on it because as Mike said, you have a lot of issue on that, challenges on tax, on social security and, and legal side, because you have a huge risk to have a, a kind of permanent establishment of the subsidiary in the country and vice versa. So we need to address all these technical issue, but definitely, yes, we are working on that and we want to accelerate as far as possible. And for the young talent, it will be much more open market also to attract people because the cost will be low, so you can have more. And for the diversity also, because you can attract from people from all over the world, depending the competency and so on. So definitely for us, the COVID is a opportunity, an accelerator for the what we call internally the revolution that we want to implement during the next two to three years. Thank you, Alexandre. Yes, it's a big shift, really interesting. And uh, well, I would like to know how uh, Schneider Electric, uh, how do you pos position yourself uh, between Renault and Saint-Gobain? <laughs> well, um, what, I, what I can say is, um, I think that there were some existing programs that, um, or strategy that helped us. Uh, during this crisis because we are already organized in a multi-hub organization which enables us to really um, leverage you know a balance between global and local um, and build local talent pipelines so this this helped us to to get through this this era where there was some um, um, more focus on local I would say um, and uh, other than that, we also have uh, put in place um, something that we call the open talent market in which which is a um, system uh, that is uh, operating and allowing people to view all of our positions, but also projects in the company. So it helps people to already connect between different locations for projects and opportunities. 
Um, and it means that we really harness the, the collective energy of, of our people and enable those kind of remote working situations anyway um, and opportunities as part of um, really offering development to, to our employees. So that open talent market and project um, matching competencies of, of internal people with, with projects and, and opportunities is really a way to, to uh, enable people to, to have some quite international experience without, without actually moving. So that was another another area which is is uh, has has helped us and and to go through this uh, this period. The other thing that we were wondering about um, and we we asked ourselves about and formed uh, a policy around was on this flexible working piece and uh, deciding whether we were a company that would enable sort of 100% remote working in the future because <laughs> going through COVID, sometimes we had to all be remote anyway. Um, but so uh, whether we wanted to be a company that, um, that promoted that or whether we wanted to have a hybrid model um, with working in the office and working from home or, or another location. And really what came back was that uh, we, we still think that having that contact with an office location, uh, plant location is extremely important for us. Um, we also obviously want to be near our customers as well as an organization. So we just made the conscious decision that we wanted to have that hybrid uh, model and enable our employees to have the flexibility to work um, as a global policy for two days uh, from home per week, um, but also to spend uh, time in their office location as well to connect with their colleagues. Um, and also it's an imp important part of, of the, the sort of humanness and building the culture of the company as well to have people connecting in that way for us. So that's why we came up with this um, hybrid model approach. And obviously not all of our employees can, can reap the benefit of that because some of their jobs really need to be performed on location. Uh, but uh, where it's possible and where the jobs allow, of course, uh, that's that's the, what we've we've gone for. Um, we haven't made this uh, an international remote working, so the the employees would work from home or another location in their country of employment, because we want to avoid some of these compliance topics that come up. Obviously, that uh, Mike was talking about earlier. Uh, which can be related to um, people remote working from another country than their country of employment. And so the, the shift of the global culture, culture is going to have a, a, an impact on, on the global mobility culture. Uh, in 2021, how do you see the global mobility? Uh, uh, how is going to be at Schneider in 2021? How do you see it? Yeah, so we're already seeing um, the, obviously we had a slowdown during the crisis in number of moves and we had to freeze some of the activity. Um, and now we're seeing the moves coming back again. Um, we, we are still quite robust in terms of our governance and the why of people moving around. So we still uh, keep in place a very solid governance process linked to our assessment of purpose of the assignment and the performance and potential of the person going so that that will remain on our you know traditional kind of program and governance and our main reasons of of, of moving people around is very similar actually to to Saint so there's the developmental transfer of expertise deployment of leaders and also people who are uh, quite simply taking up an opportunity in this uh, global um, in our global ta open talent market as well. So those those um, those purposes of mobility will still exist. Um, I think what we will see though is potentially some uh, diversification in, in um, moving away from a more traditional approach to potentially also people going for much shorter periods 
um, for more targeted um, periods of time and purposes. And also we're, we're exploring a bit more there on business travel as well, because I think once <laughs> business travel is operating again, uh, maybe we will see an increase there. Um, as an alternative to longer assignments and, and longer longer duration. So those are the some of the, the trends that uh, we may see. We may also see quite a lot of impact of compliance, protectionism of local uh, employment markets on the part of, uh, of governments as, as a post-crisis measure. Um, and that's also something that we have to navigate, obviously, uh, because it, it, it adds to the complexity, sometimes to the time and the speed that people can be deployed um, and uh, potentially also to the cost. So we have to monitor that and uh, find ways to, to live with that. Thank you so much, Susanna. And um, regarding KPMG, Shona, uh, how, do you, how is it going to, to look like the mobility uh, in KPMG in 2021? Well, uh, today we, our drivers are very similar to, to what's already been, been mentioned. Our drivers for, for international assignments are based on um, our business needs, strategic business needs tends to be the, the, the main driver. Uh, talent development also, because uh, it's important that our, our new talent um, get the opportunity to uh, well, to transfer, to acquire new skills, to uh, to get uh, out of box uh, experiences uh, and also to work on the many global projects that we have. Uh, KPMG is a, a network of member firms, so we have lots of uh, international projects that uh, people can get involved in. Uh, so those are, I guess, those main areas of, um, of mobility will continue. Um, with over the COVID period, uh, the, well, like everybody else, the, the, in March it was a flurry of activity to um, uh, to decide if our assignees were staying where they were, if they were coming back, um, and and to be quite honest, our our focus back then was not necessarily on our strategy to come. It was on our duty of care uh, to our to our people and making sure that they were comfortable where they were, or if they weren't, to get them somewhere else. So. Um, obviously, planned moves at that time, like everybody else, were put on 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 standby. Uh, we have uh, initiated some assignments on a virtual basis. Things that were planned uh, physically, we've uh, virtually um, initiated them because we're for project team, so they they're working distance uh, until we can physically get them across the Atlantic. Um, and for other assignees, they, they, they decided to work uh, remote in a, in, a, in a different country. So all those, those, issues, those things had to be managed. Um, but they've, they've also given us a bit of uh, thought, food for thought on uh, our strategy to come. There, it's, an, it's virtual assignments and remote working are, um, I think uh, things that we need to, well, we will be taking into consideration once we get back to some sort of uh, normality. Uh, I, I think there'll actually be new options for us rather than, they'll sit aside what we currently have and what we currently do uh, rather than replace them in any, in any way. I think it'll give us much more opportunity. There's people, lots of people, um, are not necessarily open to an international experience. So being able to work virtually is actually going to give us um, a bit more, um, well, a wider talent pool actually, because people who maybe weren't willing to take uh, an international assignment will be able to work uh, remotely and have, have an exciting opportunity for them and also give us a, an increased uh, talent pool. So there, there is creating opportunity too, um, we all we all live in hope that 2021 will bring us back to um, I guess some some sort of normality. Uh, and we've got like everybody else, we've got assignments on standby. Uh, the plans are to initiate those assignments as soon as it is uh, feasible, as soon as uh, borders open and uh, and people can actually can actually move. So again, I I think um, I think that the business obviously will be asking the question. 
now that we all work remotely and we, we've shown that we can work remotely um, uh, efficiently, I think the business will be saying, okay, does this person really have to relocate? So when we go through the process of authorizing what's our more structured international assignments, I think those are the quite kind of questions that we have to, that we will be asked and we will have to answer. Uh, but I, I'm convinced that in many cases, the answer is still going to be yes. Uh, I think um, in many instances, our, our, our staff need to be on the ground. They need to be in country. Uh, they need to have um, proximity with, um, with their clients. They need to have proximity with their, their, their teams. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that going forward, we'll, we'll still have our, our programs that we have today, but we'll probably have some, some different ways of doing things too. Thank you, Shona. Um, we have um, some questions uh, about um, about young uh, talent mobility. <laughs> so I think it's the, the perfect time, David, to, to switch to uh, to that topic. Hmm? Thank you very much, Elia, and thank you all of you. I mean, there are fascinating questions, and then some of them are going to be readdressed in the Q&A sessions. So we have basically 20 minutes to address the young talent mobility, and then we move to Q&A, and then the conclusion by Martin. Um, you all, I mean, touched the, the question of uh, young talent and how to track them and how key they are in the long-term business strategy of your organization. So my first question to you, to all of you is, have you ever implemented a young talent mobility program? And could you just describe very briefly uh, Alexand mentioned it. Maybe we're going to start with him. And then uh, Susanna, Shona, if it's okay with you. Um, and then, yes. Alexandre, could you just. Yes, thank you. Address? Yeah, I can start if you want. So, we have from uh, the beginning of the policy, effectively, a young talent policy. Uh, so, the idea was uh, to find a good uh, arbitrage between. Uh, cost because usually young talent, uh, you know, a package, a full package is very expensive. Uh, probably you need to pay the housing, the schooling and blah, blah, blah. And if you want to promote young talent, uh, probably you need to reduce the cost. So it was the, the philosophy. So basically, progressively, we move from the full package to a young talent package, meaning that you reduce the housing, and then probably in the future, you cut the housing. So progressively, uh, you move from a full package to a local plus package. And basically today we are, uh, thanks to the COVID, uh, we, we will have, I would say, a very good young talent package, meaning that uh, we will help uh, the young talent to move and to apply to an international position without paying housing, without paying schooling, without blah, 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 but with a guarantee, uh, of course, in terms of net, that they can live in the, uh, in the country without any uh, trouble as a, as a, in the home country. So first of all, it was a priority. Uh, the idea also is to develop our future manager, meaning that probably the length of the assignment is short, it's not five years. They are not going to stay five years in, in one position, but probably move to every one or two years to a kind of rotational, uh, I don't know in English, rotational program. So they can mm -hmm. spend two years in America, two years in Brazil, two years in China, and then uh, come back to have a higher position in, uh, in uh, their home country. Now, with uh, COVID, uh, the system and the program is still uh, blocked. And probably the idea is to open uh, the market, the job market internally. Uh, we will put all the open position in our internal job posting uh, tool. And then in the tool, it will be uh, open to local talent, local plus young talent. So we will specify uh, what kind of package this position is open to. 
meaning, and then after they can apply directly and we will pay the, the packet and so on. So we would like to put much more fluidity in the system. For the young talent, the virtual assignment, I think probably is not the best uh, because for, they want to be in this country and kind of, a, they want to move internationally. So it's a kind of feeling they want to progress and to move and to have international experience. But for the for senior people like me, I'm very old, probably you prefer to stay in your home country and so on. So you are, if the position is interesting, uh, yes, you take the position, but if you can stay in your family, in your home country, it could be more attractive. Definitely for the young talent, I think it's better uh, to have a, a package, not so expensive, but basically in, in the host country to answer to their needs. Thank you very much, Alexandre. Mm -hmm. When we prepared the uh, session with uh, my class, uh, Chiara is one of them and Luciana, they kind of identify this need of living abroad and uh, joining a group after a graduate program. So Chiara, maybe you just follow up and then we're going to ask Susanna, Agnes and Shona your question, which was related to uh, the COVID. Yeah, sure. So, um, well, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Chiara Bellini. I'm from Italy and I'm a master's student attending the second year of master at SFA Business School. So uh, my question regarding this matter is, uh, um, so how do you see the future of emerging talents development programs? So, yeah, so that's the, the yeah. main question. Yeah. So then, then it would be for Susanna, Agnes and Shona, the opportunity to talk about these two questions. What kind of uh, uh, program have you implemented and what would be the future? Susanna? Yeah, yeah. So thank you for the question, Chiara. Uh, so I think the, the, this is quite an exciting time because um, I see some opportunities there for, for what I would say early career. I don't like to say young talent because I think it always sounds a bit patronizing. So maybe early career talent, um, partly because they have really interesting skills. Um, that I think that they can bring to companies. And um, part of those, I mean, if I think about Schneider in particular, we're looking for those kind of digital, um, digital generation, right? So that is gonna help with our transformation. So I think this, this um, these skills that can be found probably more prevalently in early career talent can really help to boost um, and complement skills that are already present in some of our companies. Um, the, other, the other opportunity that I can see, which is um, linked to some of the constraints that we have and challenges that we have, um, it's that, I mean, the world has become more, well, not during COVID, obviously, but, but generally speaking, people have become more mobile and, um, and more interested, and it's become more normal to study and also uh, work abroad. So that means that people are much more open-minded about it and ready to, let's say, compete on a local talent market. If I make the link to what, what Alexandre was saying, um, I do think that uh, early career talent need to be ready to, to look at local opportunities in countries and apply to those um, because basically, on the local talent market, there are also international students who've, who've graduated in those places and who want to stay on um, and apply. So we have a very kind of rich diversity of candidates and international profiles that could be applying for jobs anyway in, our, in some of our, um, our key locations. And we've, we've got obviously, as I said, some multi-hub uh, approach and some very attractive locations there like uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Boston, uh, Paris. So, you know, we, there, there are some international workforce already in those places. So I think young talent need to be flexible to take that approach as, as applying like a local candidate um, and, um, and, and being managed under terms and conditions like a local candidate as well. 
Um, there are other programs and approaches that we also have, which would take somebody from a country where they were hired, give them some experience, um, and then uh, take them to another country to, to continue to, to work on developing their skills. Um, we've run programs like that from Singapore because we really wanted to also build our local talent pipeline there. So we took uh, fresh graduates um, that were highly closely assessed and selected, obviously, and um, moved them to some different locations to, to um, work on their skill, building their skills um, and accelerating their development. Um, and obviously that kind of strategic sort of early career program needs to be managed very carefully um, because you want to offer those, those opportunities to grow and really monitor that growth um, and uh, make sure that, that we can move people through the company at, at the kind of pace that um, early career talent expect um, and make sure that their job is, is meaningful um, and, and they're getting to grow through those opportunities. So those are the two kind of programs that I can see. I think you need to be very open-minded um, and ready to, to adapt, um, but I do see some great opportunities there. And I, I know that Schneider's a company that, that will continue to be committed to early career talent. Thank you very much, Susanna. Agnes, do you concur? Do you agree with the position that was just presented? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I agree 100% on, uh, on several things. Uh, first, the strong expectations from early career people to have international exposure and specifically to go and live abroad. It's not only international exposure, it's really to get the experience. Uh, and I do agree as well that uh, then, um, uh, obviously, the, the local markets are also very diverse and we have international candidates also on the local markets. So I recognize everything that uh, that was said. Um, then if I look at what we have um, developed, uh, and uh, I think that we will still continue on, on this track uh, at Saint-Gobain, um, is we have uh, things that are managed globally and we, we are also encouraging any uh, regional or business uh, specific programs, I would say. This is the way we operate. We are quite a decentralized organization because we are very, very diverse activities. So what, what we have globally uh, is, we, we rely a lot uh, for European uh, early career talents on the um, VIE program. And we try to, to develop it uh, as much as possible, not only for French, but also we try to promote it for any European, uh, European uh, young, uh, young talents. We have been uh, growing uh, on the numbers on this, uh, and really, when we and we are very selective on the uh, on the type of mission that that we that we offer to the VI. It's not like we don't consider it at all that it's another internship. No, not at all. It needs to be really a project that is clearly identified. We coach the manager also on the support they will provide and the development paths that they will provide to the VI. They hire. Etc. So, so we have very diverse uh, type of VIEs in uh, business development, uh, research and development, uh, engineering projects, so all types of jobs that uh, that can be uh, also very yeah business development, including in very new countries for us. So, this is one of the things that we have um, uh, we have been uh, developing and growing. Um, but uh, apart from this, we, we also have uh, many regional uh, development uh, programs. And uh, when I said region, it's because we have a governance per region. And here we, we have programs called Global Players, uh, where it's more rotational uh, program where we, we have, for example, in 18 months time, uh, you have three different assignments in at least two different functions and at least two different countries. So it's really like a, a early career uh, accelerator, I would say. This is this is meant to be to be this, and also to be a glue uh, for people to uh, to really uh, uh, get to know us, uh, get to know the most they can about the Saint Gobain Group, and uh, and uh, hopefully they like us and they stay with us as long as possible. Uh, so this is another example, uh, more for a regional uh, approach, and then we have a business approach where uh, for for some of the global businesses they have like tech trainee programs really uh, on their core skills. So they deploy and they train six months in a plant. And then these people become ambassador of these skills in a less mature plant uh, for 18 to, to 24 months. So different kinds of approaches, uh, either per business or per region and the VA program as well. And I think that is, this will continue in the future. 
uh, also with more diverse approach with the virtual assignments, etc. that we have discussed just before. But, but thank you very much, Agnes. But just to fully understand what it is, it's not like a graduate program where it's one size fits all. It's, you have all sorts of uh, uh, a custom made, if I may express that mm -hmm. way, uh, program for mobility and young talent, correct? Absolutely. This is a, a, a little bit of the way we operate generally, I would say. We really customize to, uh, uh, to the local markets and the businesses in which we, we are operating. But we have some common framework and principles that we encourage this type of programs. Uh, we share the best practices across the group about this program. So the Global Player Program I, I was talking about started in Germany, but then you have similar examples in the other regions because we get some inspirations from, uh, from what uh, other regions or businesses are doing inside the group and we try to be consistent across all these programs but we let also the initiative to the markets because they they know the, the local market they know the, the expectations of the local talents as well uh, in which they operate so i think it's also it can be also a strength to rely on uh, proximity uh, to the to the talent pool uh, and, uh, and and their expectations thank you very much and yes and for shana Virtual assignment, uh, mobility program, the impact of COVID. What is your position on all these questions? Well, I, I guess I mean, for, as far as as far as our, our our probably younger talent, we they have access to our um, structured international assignment program uh, once they have uh, about three years uh, professional experience. Um, with you or is it with you? Or it, well. They could have come for some, they know they could have come from another activity, uh, uh, but they would be uh, three years within uh, our structure, you would have uh, the title of a senior experienced senior so I'm, if they've joined us with that title, then they, they, they could qualify. Um, and those type of moves, uh, just to to go back to what Alexandra was saying, um, we would be giving what we call a peer approach. So they would be going on to local conditions. They would certainly get the relocation support that they need to, to, to get them there, but it would be a lighter package than say our strategic, uh, our strategic, strategic partner and very serious senior people who are moving around. Um, for the younger people, we also have a swap program, um, KPMG uh, International for certain uh, activities um, run swap programs. They last for uh, six months. So we'll have, say, a French person going to, to one country and uh, somebody coming inbound to, to France to give a bit of uh, cross border e experience. Uh, they run particularly in our advisory services. Um, and then, of course, we, well, we're, an in, we're a network of um, member firms. We're based in 150 countries. So obviously um, this network provides an enormous amount of opportunities uh, to, to, to anybody who, who wants to apply from, 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 from France or, or elsewhere. Uh, so there's um, opportunities there that we accompany them to find a permanent position. Uh, so there we're, we're not in a structured mobility program. We're helping them to find a position and they continue their career with uh, KPMG in the, in the other country. We have, uh, like Alexandra was saying for Renault, we have job boards for our international assignment roles, but we also have a job board for our, what we call maybe a local hire or a direct transfer role. Um, so these are particularly, well, particularly used by, by the young people who are maybe not patient enough or they, 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 they're more excited to move on after a year or two and not wait for maybe for there to be maybe a, a business driven uh, assignment uh, that's suitable for them. Uh, but it's also an ideal solution for people who are moving uh, for family or personal reasons. It, it means, you know, they can continue their career with, uh, with KPMG in another, in another country. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, Luciana, uh, when we prepare the, the, the session, you had one question to ask. And then if you accept, uh, we have roughly 16, 17 minutes for a Q&A session. Uh, and we have so many questions in the chat. So uh, Celia and I are going to sort of voice your concern or voice your questions. But in between, Luciana. 
Hi, hello. My name is Luciana. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm Luciana. I'm from Argentina. I'm in the MIM program at Le CCP. And my question is, how has COVID-19 impacted these programs, these young uh, talent mobility programs, and how did you adapt to the COVID? Thank maybe. You. Thank you very much, Luciana. Shona, maybe? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I guess, well, the initial impact for our CR swap programs or people who were about to go um, out on assignment was to unfortunately stop the move. Um, but the program, certainly for our swap program, uh, they have uh, been put on hold, so they're not canceled. Uh, and as soon as we can get um, things moving again, as soon as borders open, as soon as it's it, it's safe also for people to move. I think there, there are two aspects. Yes, we can move, the borders are open, but we have to be, we have to ensure that where they're going, they're going to be safe and uh, that we're looking after them properly. Uh, but uh, certainly we, things are on hold because it's not possible to be, do things any other way, but um, they're just on hold and we're hoping that 2021 will get them moving again. David, what, uh, what, what about um, sweep, switching to all the questions? Yes, absolutely. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? Um, I can start because the, the, there was a lot of question about uh, uh, what does, does mean young talent or early career? <laughs> so what is the early career for you? So is it um, a fresh graduate, uh, someone who has uh, worked one to three years in your company? Uh, this is uh, the first question. Susanna, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, I can speak in terms of our international mobility policy. Um, and there we define it as uh, people who have under five years professional experience. Okay. Agnes? Well, uh, if I look at the programs I was talking about, I think that uh, most of them are focused on fresh graduates. But of course, it can be fresh graduates who have had experience before, because now, uh, you know, you can have a graduation after having worked a few years. So it's really like, yeah, I would say between two, between zero and potentially five years of experience. I mean, uh, depending on your uh, on your path. Thank you very much. Alexandre, you are French, you are Japanese, you are everywhere. <laughs> Where does it start? It starts from the beginning of the <laughs> career. <laughs> In fact, I agree. It's not a question of age, definitely. It could be later. It could be what we like to do is really to open the market, not based on experience, age, or whatever. So probably you will have open market internally, and people could apply. And what we call young career group, in fact, is a kind of a local plus package so everybody can apply uh, you can have for even for the senior for family reason you want to go back to america and so you can stay in the company with local condition or just a payment of a home and so on so probably i i don't like the term uh, young or like you said it's probably much more based on the needs of the company and then according to your experience, to what you want to do personally, because we say always that in Renault, you are the uh, owner of your career. So this is your responsibility to do what you want and to apply where you want to go. Then after we have a package, you know what is a package, you apply. So definitely uh, I would prefer to say uh, to based on the needs of people, because on top of that, we need also to put some flexibility, customization, because what you want you, uh, David, probably is not what I want me, <laughs> not on everything, maybe on, <laughs> maybe on food, I don't know. So we need to find, to really to answer to the needs of, of the population, what we have inside. So I will prefer to have a kind of a, local plus package with the health than young package or career development package because you cannot move if you don't uh, put an added value where you go uh, the host country will not take you if you don't have the competency to answer uh, their needs so you need to have the competency first that's it because you cannot force 
the host country, okay, you 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 have to take maybe two or three students for two years. You will pay them, and then after they move, so they they have the cost and they don't have the added value. So it's not working on long term because uh, one time they say, okay, we don't want any more. It's too expensive. There is no added value. So it's really based, I would say, on open competency job posting market. If, of course, we need to uh, have this guy in this country, it's a decision from the company. So we will pay the full package because we want this guy at this position. But if it's based on the personal needs or ambition, then we will apply the local plus package. I don't know if I answer to your question, but- No, you have, you have. But there are follow-up questions in the chat regarding the nationality, whether it applies, you, you tell me whether I'm right or wrong, it applies to all students, whether Europeans or non-Europeans, it's not only in English, um, and then what kind of questions, and then there were questions related to the French position about the IE position and whether it would be preceded after 2021, but just to be sure, and for all of you, Susanna, Agnes and Jonah, that applies for Europeans and non-Europeans, and it applies for um, uh, in English, but also in the local language, correct? Maybe uh, yeah, for uh, Alexandre... Renault, You need to speak English first, of course. If you speak French, it's, it's good, <laughs> because uh, we have a mother company. For Nissan, if you speak Japanese, it's better. Uh, and that's it. But English, it's enough, huh? definitely. Susanna, Agnes, do you agree with that? Shona as well? Uh, well, for us, English would be a, a must to go on a, an assignment. So I, again, each country would uh, decide their requirements if they needed to, if it was Germany and they needed to speak German, uh, they, the, the, the country who are hosting them will, could possibly say that they need local language too. Susanna, and yes. yeah, yeah, I think generally just for pragmatic reasons, uh, when we're moving people around to have the English language skills, also just to participate in the, the developmental learning aspects uh, of programs. And if they're programs where there's a kind of cohort, you know, you need internationally, you need the people to be able to connect and, and share things. So um, it, it, it is uh, just from a practical perspective useful to have those <laughs> English English language skills. And yes, and then Celia. Yeah, no, just to confirm, of course, uh, English is a must, I would say, but uh, we also uh, encourage very much on the local language, uh, wherever relevant, because if we look pragmatically at things and we are talking about people who are maybe going to work in a plant, then many people in the plant might not speak English, I mean, at different levels in the organization. So I think it's also something that is important and also it emphasizes the interest that you have for a culture, I would say. So if you are curious about a country, I would say that you are curious about the language. Uh, for me, this goes, this goes well together. Celia? Yeah, yes. Just, just to, to add quickly, uh, you know, I had, a, I, I was recruited in three countries, uh, Panama, Argentina and Colombia. Uh, in three different companies uh, locally. So uh, I totally did what you, you were talking about. Uh, to go to the country, uh, to be in competition with international and, and local uh, competencies to apply and uh, to have the package of the local country. And uh, I was ob obviously uh, speaking Spanish and uh, I had to speak Spanish and, and English and French was a plus, but uh, it was not useful. So pragmatically, it's, uh, it's that. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, I, I go on with all the, um, all the questions. Uh, how many expats in Schneider Electric do you have? Yeah, across our different mobility programs, around 700 active assignees today. Uh, Mike, maybe a, a question for you. What are the trends over the next few years? <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, uh, you, you can't answer that, I don't know. Uh, what are the trends over the next three years regarding expatriates? Still growing, steady, decline? Tell us, tell us the yeah, okay. 
<laughs> uh, well, over the next three years, um, as I in initially, once the borders open, I think there will be uh, a rapid acceleration when uh, people, we, everyone's talked about the, the build up of pressure to move people. So I think there'll be like the floodgates opening and there'll be an initial rush. I think then there will be a slowdown in the number of expatriates uh, for uh, a, a period while the economies recover and, and trade builds up again. Um, and sort of by the time we get to three years time, I would hope that um, there will be mobility will again be uh, much more uh, prevalent. There'll be more, more of it again. Um, but to, I think a point that a couple of the panelists made before, the mix will be different. Uh, I think in the, in, the, 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 in the long term, over the next three years, there'll be more short term, there'll be more business trips, as people have mentioned, there'll be more permanent transfers, uh, people going on local packages. And what we know as traditional expat packages, there will be fewer of them. That's a very quick response to a big question, but hopefully that covers it. Thank you very much. Mike, there is a follow-up question on what yes. you have presented or not presented, which is the pressure on pay and in the future of mobility. Would there be a sort of, a, a, a sort of a, a pressure to sort of uh, harmonize uh, the pay, uh, whether for expats or for locals? Um, yes. So from, from a pay perspective, pay is part of that bigger picture of cost. Um, specifically with with um, with expatriates. Um, interesting, again, I talked about the history of the previous recession. If you look um, actually over, I've, sadly, I've been now through four big recessions in my career. Um, each time policies have been cut back, the generosity in policies has been reduced. I think Alexandre mentioned that, the, the reduced elements. Many companies now are at a stage where there's not that much more that they can cut out of um, a traditional policy without losing the attractiveness of, of actually making people want to go on assignments. So from a package perspective, there is some uh, element of cost reduction there, but companies are shifting the focus more to, towards the governance um, and looking much more at the purpose of an assignment and what's the value of the assignment and are there different ways of moving people that are uh, of less cost because the traditional way has been paired back as far as it can go anyway. So then you see that shift towards sending people on a short term assignment instead of a long term or you send them on a local package instead of as a, as a traditional assignment. So I think that's where the, the focus on pushing down the, the cost more generally is, uh, is, is coming from uh, a redistribution. Thank you very much, Mike. I have uh, a, a question that is, was raised by many students, but also um, some of the um, people attending the seminar. And it's uh, how you solve the conflict between all the, let's say the tension between mobility and sustainable challenges. Global mobility versus sustainable challenges at uh, Saint-Gobain, KPMG, uh, all of you, maybe Susanna. <laughs> And then we leave to them. Yeah, that's a good, uh, it's a very good question because obviously when you have people moving around the world, uh, there is a sustainability challenge there. So I think uh, part of that is making sure that we are working uh, because when, you, when you're moving people, you have a lot of different um, external providers providing support as well. So whenever we partner with our people who support the relocation, we're looking at how they put in place actions to ensure more sustainability, less impact, um, and how sustainable they are as, as, uh, as companies and responsible. Um, obviously, we have to also look at uh, how we referred to it before, what's the purpose of moving the person? And does that does that purpose correspond to a real need? We're not just doing this to enable travel, you know, we're <laughs> doing this for a specific purpose. And uh, we will always look also at whether, whether a more local opportunity is possible. So can we move people more on a regional basis, which involves less distance, which involves less, um, less impact potentially, 
Um, uh, can we can we look at that, uh, or can we look at local candidates, international candidates in the local market as well? So there's that. There's the governance piece. There's also looking at who we partner with, um, and uh, some of you know what we support in terms of of relocation. Do we support shipping around the world a huge load of uh, possessions, or do we? Uh, enable people to take a furnished apartment, for example, in their host location. So, so we would take into account some of these elements when we we are making decisions to to be obviously responsible <laughs> as a company about uh, our mobility program. And and we have we have actually reduced the amount of mobility in the company over over several years because we we do want to have. A sustainable local talent pipeline as well, which we see as very critical to our local customers, you know, to be able to interact and be supported by people who understand the local culture as well. So mobility, yes, but selective with a purpose and obviously managing some of the, the impact of the program as well. C'est bien. Euh, oui, bah, je, je, on, on propose à Martine de, de conclure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Martine, uh, who is the, with us, the, the strong leader of, uh, of this project? So, you have the floor, Martine, to conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. It's a great honor for me to conclude this first round table on the topic of the future of global mobility. As Franklin Roosevelt said in a speech in 1939, do something. If it works, do more of it. If it doesn't, do something else. For us, legal practitioners, they constitute the jewels of our research work, which will be the subject of your next round table. We hope that in turn, we can make your task easier by providing a more secure legal framework for your future practices. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, because as she said, uh, all that kind of new, new mobility will have so, so many impacts in terms of uh, legal stuff. So good luck for uh, all, uh, all lawyers and, uh, and, and legal students. David, I thank you so much. I was really happy uh, to facilitate this session. Thank you so much to all the speakers, Susanna, Agnes, Mike, uh, Shona, Alexandre. Uh, thank you very much to being here. Uh, very, very, very proud to represent Magellan members and uh, to represent Magellan tonight. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. It was much. a great pleasure. Thank you, thank you thank very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. A good, bye. Uh, a good uh, Macron uh, interview. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.